You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV for this last minute kind of live stream that we decided I decided to do. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, just a novice angler uh, who was up all night yesterday, I think partying pretty hard, if I'm not mistaken. <clears throat> I was up a long time with them bass and bruise boys <laughs> and girls. Wow. How was that? What were you guys talking about? Oh, God, Tom, nothing that we can talk about on your podcast. I promise you. <laughs> we'll get you if canceled. we discuss it here, it will get you canceled, my friend. And Jake's bait and tackle will not be happy with you. I keep People keep telling me I need to start a separate show with my free time and actually do more of a uh, after hours kind of thing with drinking and stuff. So who knows? Maybe that'll come eventually. It was, it was, man, it was, um, God, I don't even, you know, you just got to watch it. I don't even want to say it. You just got to watch it. Oh my goodness. So besides that, I mean, how much fishing have you been getting into lately? Oh gosh. Uh, not enough. I, I, I haven't been on the water a whole lot since the beginning of the winter. Um, <clears throat> I took the winter to kind of do some housekeeping projects here. Uh, we replaced all of our cast iron drain pipes in the house with new PVC. I did that myself with the help of um, Aaron Fetterman, a buddy of mine. Um, we, you know, that was a pretty big undertaking for me because I'm not like, I'm not a plumber. I've never done plumbing. Um, so we're doing that. And then we're, we're changing out all the, all of the supply lines from copper to PEX and we just had solar panels put in today, um, kind of renovating a bathroom at the same time. It's, you know, husbandry type thing. The winter is really weird because there has been this thing where I mean, in years past, because of hunting and, you know, the old cliche, people don't want to fish in the fall and the winter because of hunting and God knows what else, football. And now you're looking at tournament trails where they're pushing more and more into the winter. And, and honestly, it's like, welcome to the party for me. Cause I, I love winter time. I was a little late getting this together. Cause I was literally on the water. I had to haul ass back home. Cause I was fishing. Um, I freaking love it. Do you feel like there's an uptick in people that are actually going to go out there this time of year, especially with the kayak fishing? No. Um, I think there's less, I mean, I think somebody's saying we have an echo, but, um, I think that there's actually less people uh, that are interested in winter fishing from a kayak specifically because of the extra gear that it requires. Um, you know, you got to have a dry suit if you're going to do it safely and if out there, you got to, well, the other thing too is you should really go out with someone else in the winter time as well, because if you fall out, you know, that's not a good, not a good day. Um, so then you got to find somebody else who's crazy enough to go fishing with you in 35 degree air temps and all that jazz. Um, but you know, there's still a lot of jet boats out there running. There's still a lot of guys that go out fishing in the, in the winter time in general on the river, just not as much in, from the kayak. Why is that? I think it's, I, I, I think it's just because of the extra gear required and all that stuff. Um, you know, a dry suit, a good dry suit is anywhere between $500 and $1,500. Um, you know, and then the other thing about finding somebody else to go with you, to, you know, should be, uh, they're saying definitely an echo from me. I don't know if you see that, but. Yeah, I'm going to try to adjust that real quick here, guys. The new audio equipment you got is just fantastic. Let's go with secondary. How about now? Secondary. All right. Anything? So, guys, count, let me know if that's any better. Um, I don't hear the echo on my end, so that might be that might be better. Um, but you know, right now, especially with the river being up high, um, you know, there's a, a lot of flow. It's it's you know spreading out from the banks. Um, it's pretty dangerous for kayak fishing right now. You really have to have a, a lot of skill level to get out there right now. Um, so I think I think that's one of the main reasons why we, there's not as many kayak fishermen out there in the wintertime. But there's still big fish to be had and there's still big fish being caught. Um, you know, they obviously slowing down the presentation a little bit, but um, I know guys are still catching the crap out of them. So. 
when does kayak fishing really get going for you again? Because I know last year you had a bunch of big wins. It was really the summertime in the fall. Do you have any bigger tournaments um, going on next year that you're going to be planning on fishing? So in years past, the the kayak fishing tournaments for me have really started in like January, February timeframe down in the Southern turn, um, going down to Florida and stuff like that. I don't know if that's something that I'm going to be able to do this year with all of the home renovation projects going on. I don't know how much my travel is going to be, you know, impacted by that. Well, I guess we'll depend. It really depends on how much my only fan starts pulling in. But um, as far as, you know, as far as the money goes, it, you know, anytime you're renovating a house, that's like you'll budget 10 grand and then 15, 20 grand later, you're like, oh, I went over budget. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> there's a little bit happening there. So I, <clears throat> I don't know what my travel schedule is going to be like. I can tell you that for sure, um, April, when we start the local series here with the Mid-Atlantic region, um, April 6th, we have a I think it's April 6th. We have a huge, it's going to be a big event on the Juniata river. Hmm. And that is going to be absolutely epic with a extra on the epic. The Juliata is so interesting to me. And this is the whole thing. And as I told everyone, because I get so many emails and text messages about, you need to cover this, you need to cover this. Every year I'm going to add to my, to the content in the content areas. Last year, I really wanted to make sure the James River and the New River got in the rotation. The Susquehanna was always being hit. But now I realize after doing a year covering the Susquehanna, it is an injustice just to call the Susquehanna the Susquehanna. There are so many portions and, and pieces to it. Um, yeah. You can't cover the whole damn thing in one shot. You almost have to break it into separate episodes. And the Juliata, I had a great conversation with, with a guy that lives there. He's like, holy shit, that's like its own river system. I don't know. June. June. Iata. Juniata. 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 Yeah, not Julie. Julie. Julie, Ju Julie ain't there. It's like I um, talk for a living or something, right? <laughs> it's it's so I was gonna I was gonna I was gonna correct you, but I didn't know really how to do it. So I figured I would just go Yell. with my baseline, which is asshole. Um <laughs> so, you were um yeah, with. it's so there there are a lot of different sections that you could really break the river up into. Um, you know, I don't know, I don't know the stretches above Sunbury when you, when you break out into the North branch and the West branch, I don't know those as well. Um, anywhere from Sunbury down to really, you know, the York Haven Middletown area, um, those I know pretty well, but those are, I mean, you could break that section up into a couple of different, you know what I mean? Like that section alone is, is different. Um, in, in some areas. And then you have the Juniata, which is a big player, especially in the springtime. Um, the Juniata is a migration zone for those fish whenever they go to spawn. There's a lot of fish that, that migrate up the Juniata. And there's also a lot of resident fish up in the Juniata that, that you know, stay up there all year long. But, um, you know, the Juniata is a big, big, big spawning migration hub. And that's, you know, you can go up to Juniata in the early springtime and you can have, you know, 20, 25, 30 pound days, maybe. Wow. Um, like, you know, you get up there and you catch, you, you're going to get into some five pounders for sure. Um, it, you know, so you, you know, you have a good day. You could end up with five over five that's or insane. five close to five. Like it, it's, you know, I guess the off chance of catching a 30 pound bag would be like really historic, but a 25 pound bag, I would think is doable up there in the springtime. Um, and it's, you know, it, it goes in sections like you, in the early spring, you're going to catch them as they're moving up in the down, down towards the, the mouth. And then you move all the way up to wherever they figure out a good place to go. And it's any, any, really any tributary of the Susquehanna is like that. Um, if you go to some of the major creeks, they're the same way. Um, you know, you can catch them in the pens and the Mahatango and, and, um, oh gosh, the Cana de Gwinnett. And I mean, there's all up and down the river, there's major creeks that feed it. And the Juniata just happens to be the most major Creek because it's its own river system. So. Hmm. That's interesting. We um, and then guys, as always, um, if you want to watch this on the uh, before the reupload, go over to Patreon. You can watch it with all the Patreon supporters. We got another two minutes here before I close it down on YouTube. 
because we already have it uh, available to all of our Patreons on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and whatnot. We had I had I had three river rats on for a Christmas special that's going to be dumping guys uh, first week of January. And between them was like a hundred years of experience. And between them, they fished the Shenandoah, the Upper Potomac, and the, and the Susquehanna. And two things that came to mind that I want to bounce off you. One is the fish aren't hundred percent in their winning wintering holes in some places because the weather's been funky. Two, the definition of a wintering hole has changed because of the flathead catfish. Um, yeah. Is that what are your vibes on that? <laughs> um, a lot of vibes on that. Um, <laughs> I, I I do think that those that that the fish I don't I don't necessarily think that the weather patterns have really affected where they're at as much as the the flathead catfish have. I think people were finding them in different places that they wouldn't typically find them. Um and I think a lot of that is, you know, it's for the old heads, for the guys that have been fishing this river for 30, 40 years, you know, they know where to go. They know where to catch them. Um, and then now they're finding them in new places and they think, oh, it's been warm. So maybe they're here. No, I, I think you're going to go back there and you're going to find them there later in the winter. You're going to find them close to there later in the winter because that just the, the flatheads have taken over the wintering holes. Um, and those fish, you know, it's hard to survive in those wintering holes whenever there's, you know, 40, 40 pound flatheads in that wintering hole, a, a four or five pound smallmouth is in danger mm-hmm. you know what i mean so they they're they're relocating they're finding other areas that they can winter and i'm not saying that those guys are wrong i'm not we have had some warm days that have made them do different things and maybe made them move away from wherever they were wintering but the definition of a wintering hole somewhat has changed they're still looking for similar stuff but it's not going to be nearly as what it was in the in the past and you're still going to catch smallmouth in the wintering holes for the ones that are brave that are going there and they're th- well i can swim faster and then they get eaten so yeah that, that's interesting um the flathead are just such a unique thing because i remember when people complained about the musky issue on the shenandoah and the upper potomac and like oh this is the big bad the flathead it's it's a hell of an issue. And I know we're going to have to have different shows to really talk about this and, and the fish behavior change. Um, but before we get into the big fishing report, guys, I'm shutting it down on YouTube. I'm switching it over. Don't worry. This is going to be re-uploaded in a week uh, for everyone's all eyes to see. Uh, but just trying to give the Patreon to something a little bit different. So if you want to go on over to Patreon, you can continue to watch this bad boy. Um, again, link in below. Check it out, Patreon. And we'll see you guys later. And then, okay, so we are now private there. So to continue with the Susquehanna, what is the perfect temperature that you're looking for this time of year to get them into that, into that winter mode, but also that they're still going to bite? Um, I think anything, you know, between 38 and 45, really. I mean, you know, you can catch them, still catch them on, on moving baits pretty good in the upper forties and lower fifties. Um, you know, so to me, like truly wintering fish, I would say anywhere below that maybe 47, 48, you know, um, if it, if it's getting down that low, uh, yeah, I would think that they're going to be holding up in the, in the, in the areas where you would expect them to, to winter, even if they're not in the actual wintering hole, you know, there's very few 20 foot deep holes out here on the Susquehanna river. Um, but you know, you you'll find them in, in places in decent size eddies and stuff. But once it gets down to that, 48 47 time and even whenever it's close to that they're going to be close anyway because they're they've already started migrating way before that to mm-hmm. back you know into some of those holes so you'll find them if you can catch them from the migration on the migration route coming from the faster water going you know into the areas where you would expect them to be come winter time you can really get into them then too in the late fall um <clears throat> But I know, man, I know there's guys out there right now that are, I mean, they're catching them all over the river. So that's freaking awesome. We got, we got Matthew. Uh, he says kayak feet pick on OnlyFans. Is there a market? I'll whore my toes. <laughs> is, I don't know. Is OnlyFans a thing? Does it actually work like that? Or is it just like two or three people that have, have made us all think that you just snap a few? I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm grossing about $25 a month, you know? And all I do is, oh, God, <laughs> I'm not going to say what, 
I'm not, this is not true. <laughs> For one. Um, no, I'm not going deeper into that. <laughs> if he shows up with a new kayak, we know what happens. If I show up with a new Vexus boat, you guys damn well know what I did. And I sold my body or my wife or whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't hey, I, hey, listen. I'll I'll give her a cut. She can get a new horse. It's for the greater good. Yeah, you guys get a new boat and a new horse. I mean, you know, it's one thing to be upset when someone does that for five bucks, but for these like teachers that are like, oh yeah, I made a million dollars and got fired. It's like I get it. I really do. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> well, it's just like in my career field. You know, you see female cops doing it all the time. Really? So, yeah. I know the teachers yeah. were a thing. I didn't know female cops were a thing. Yeah. Or your category in your browser is way different than mine. <laughs> <laughs> My algorithm is Jack. <laughs> oh, shit. Goodness uh, gracious. See, we went there. Every time you're on, we have to go there. It uh, um, livens um, things up a little bit. I'm all for it. <laughs> oh, who do we got here over on Instagram? Um, Why does my hat look so weird? Because it's beat to hell. It looks like it's been through some stuff. I actually what? finally got a Torquedo off of eBay. I'm pretty pumped about that. Um, it's just, I have no battery or installing crap, but at least I'll have a trolling motor this year, which will make life way freaking easier. Because that nice. pedaling shit, I was, my crotch was cramping up when I was fishing the river. Just how much pedaling. But I had the calves of Lance Armstrong. It was banging. Uh, we got hello, gents. Okay, cool. Uh, we got one question here on the Instagram is like, what is a definite? And I know we've covered this, but we'll just reiterate it again. Uh, Ryan, um, Mossman, I think, what is the definition of a wintering hole? And I'm thinking he means by depth. So the, the great Jeff little has taught me through many, many days He's still out. alive. Everyone don't, don't forget. Yeah. He, he has not died yet. <laughs> um, no, but he, you know, the biggest thing is you're looking for decreased flow, right? You're looking for a de decreased flow rate and you're looking for an area that it typically you would consider an eddy with enough depth that you know they can not be susceptible to birds and other types of aerial type of prey um the other aspect of that too is you know you'd like to find something with a hard bottom not something like a a, a leaf you know leaf and silt but if you could find something with a hard bottom that's even uh, an even better type of wintering hole and some of that's because the sunlight penetrates the water and heats up the rock and the rock retains heat longer than dead leaves or mud will so you know even a half a degree or degree temperature difference can attract a fish to a to one eddy versus another um you know if they're equal and you know they have equal types of water flow um jeff always tells me to look for the bubble trails that are not moving that was an interesting you, video he did on that actually yeah if you look for the bubble trails that aren't moving typically there will be some fish there Another thing that I've I've found interesting in my winter career is fishing fast slowly and you don't just sit in one hole for eight hours. Mm. Here's my issue with this, and I've had a couple of guys on to talk about it, is if you've never fished the river, I think it's hard for people to understand or, or novice. I fished the upper Potomac enough. I got like three or four wintering holes. I can bounce pretty quickly knowing there should be fish in four or five spots. How long, if you're on a new portion of river, do you give a spot before you bounce when you don't have years of experience? Um, you know, that's tough, man, because, you know, you want to you want to hit it thoroughly and you know that, you know, they're not going to have the increased um, metabolism. So they're not going to be eating as much. Um, you know, I, I think that you I think you rotate through, you know, maybe four or five different baits giving them, you know, a few casts on each bait to try to see if maybe a presentation is going to work over another. Um, I think after that, if you know, um, hold on one second, one second, Jacob, okay. do you think it's a great idea to wear your brand new $70 Carhartt pants to a bonfire? Yeah, I would do that. Are there girls? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, um, that's the logic of a 16 year old. Um, so what was i saying thomas where was i at <laughs> those pants screwed you up man good <laughs> lord <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's got dude like oh, i wish i was that age again good lord no i don't i was such an asshole and uh, not a lot's changed <laughs> <laughs> here today gone tomorrow uh 
I said that to my wife on her third date and we got married. I don't know how that worked out. Don't well, I think I think face. it was for her. I think it was your beautiful locks of hair. Sure as hell can't be that. She fucking hates my head. No, my she hair. Doesn't. I guess my face is fine. She probably thinks that. <laughs> he said my face is fine. Yeah, it's just the above part looks like a raccoon died on top of it. <laughs> oh. Um, I mean, just to get this conversation back on track a little bit. I think I remember where I was at. I talked about the, you know, we're rotating through your baits, whatever your presentations are. And some of that could be honestly, you know, going from a hair jig to, you know, a small craw presentation, like Ned Rig style presentation to going through something that, you know, maybe that doesn't look like a craw and maybe looks like a mad Tom or something like that. Um, and, you know, the other aspect too is don't don't count out slow rolling a you know some sort of bladed bait like a chatter bait or a spinner bait or maybe even an a rig um, or running a you know a glide bait through there. If a fish is going to eat one or two times a day, what's to say that they're not going to eat big that one or two times? So it's an opportunity thing. If they see a shad that looks looks like it's dying, you know, floating there through the water column, they're going to come up and smash it. So. I had a I have a hypothesis on this from from winter fishing this year, and I, I basically guys committed to learning the Demiki rig and live scope for river smallmouth right now. It seems like with river smallmouth in particular, if you put a bait on the bottom, hair jig, Ned rig tube, they will sit and stare at that thing for six hours before they make a bite. But if you just slow drift something by them, it does, I don't know, you get a better reaction out of them. It's a quicker, it's it's more immediate. Right. Do you also see something like that when you mentioned slow rolling things that they will, it's either they get it or they don't? I mean, it, it, it really is going to depend on the fish, right? Um, it's going to depend 100% on the fish and, and their mood. Um, but, you know, if you've tried that, presentation of letting it sit and playing that staring game you know you're staring at them they're staring at your bait and you're waiting for them to put it in their mouth you know we go through this in marriage all the time we do it you know it's it's very similar to to you know winter time with your wife so you know you you pay attention to you know your line and you're watching for any sudden movement you're watching for you know maybe the line gets tight all of a sudden you didn't even feel the bite the line just all of a sudden gets tight like that's how we're detecting bites, right? And, and we're waiting for a long period of time. I've seen Jeff Little go, you know, two, three, four, five minutes between moving his bait and not moving his bait before he moves it again. Like I don't have that ability. It's one of the reasons why I'm not as as successful of a wintertime fisherman as I probably could be if I would learn that. I have ADD, ADHD. I'm not sure what I have. I have all of it. Um, I fish like, I fish like I'm on cocaine most of the time. So I struggle with that aspect of it. But one thing that I, that I don't struggle with and that I, I know works pretty well is that, you know, that glide bait in the winter time, you know, you're running that glide bait through a water column, you get four or five, six feet of water or something like that. And you get a slow slink, a slow sink guide glide bait, and you just run it through there and just move it, let it kind of just real slowly sink, move it again. And and to them, it just looks like that shad is not making it through the winter. Let me go grab it. Same concept really with, you know, with a spinner bait, you know, it looks like a dead shad or a dead, you know, something dead that's crawling across the bottom. You're really slow rolling it. You're not, you're, you know, all you're doing is keeping the blades moving basically. You're going to get snagged up doing that. I wouldn't necessarily recommend spending or using $25 super eruptions on it, but um, I would maybe go with like an eight or $9 spinner bait to do that. But you're going to want something with also with a little bit bigger blades that has some weight to it that you can just kind of slow roll down there. Um, same thing with the chatter bait. I know Jeff has been exper uh, experimenting a little bit with a uh, jackhammer with like a hair tied on the back of it. Hmm. Because he goes out and finds roadkill and then scrapes the hair off of him. It's really weird. I don't know if you're being sarcastic or serious. I'm not you. being sarcastic. He just, it's 100% Jeffrey Dahmer tendencies. Um, he was telling me, <laughs> I hope he doesn't get mad at me for this, but it was like maybe two weeks ago or so. 
he was telling me this story. He was super excited about it. And he was going out, he went out with Cooper, his son, and they were driving down the roads looking for roadkill. And he, every time they'd find a deer, like they'd stop and he'd go out and like cut their tails off. And I'm like, you're one step away. Oh my God. That's kind of what Dahmer did to start out, you know, like that's one step. <laughs> so, but Jeff's doing it for fishing purposes. So Jeff, um, if you're listening, I would love to get you and Jake on a drinking show sometime. Uh, <laughs> we neither one of us drink, neither one of us drink. So good luck. <laughs> other purposes. Then we can find other substances. That's fine. Um, yeah, that's so interesting with the hair jig. That's something else that I really need to get more into is that hair jig type of fishing for some reason that passed me i was a tube guy and then i became a ned rig guy and the hair jig is such a and i think it's because i'm not just a river rat i also fish a lot of lake tournaments and i just the hair jig is is a quintessential river smallmouth it really is yeah and when we're talking about hair jigs just to be clear we're also we're we're not typically talking about the ounce ounce and a half hair jigs that they're throwing out on oh. the tennessee ledges you know we're talking about the small eighth ounce black hair jig is what I'm referring to. Um, not saying that that ounce, ounce and a half hair jig wouldn't work because it might. I just have never thrown an ounce or an ounce and a half bait in you know a couple of feet of water and expected it to work. I've never done that. Um, maybe someone should try should try it. But uh, when I'm referring to the hair jig, I'm typically talking about you know a a, a small passive action type of bait um, presentation, and that's I mean we could lead into that too your wintertime baits, anything that has a passive action, right? Anything that has its, it's con the same concept with the tubes. If you get, if you get the tubes and they're just sitting there and they're just kind of like doing that in the water column, that's a passive action. You're not moving the bait, but the bait's moving. And I think that's, that's, you know, that's a big time thing for the same thing with like the, the mad toms, you know, that little tail is just sitting back there wiggling with whatever current might be there or it's sticking straight up in the air. Um, if you get the, you know, the floating type of plastic, like the Elastec and stuff, um, <clears throat> that passive action is really important. You get that passive action with hair, of course, because hair is, I mean, we could probably cut some of yours off and make some beautiful hair jigs. I know they'd be repulsed by it. Um, like so many people are, but you know, it'd, be, it'd be one way to get to, to keep your best friend from catching one. Uh, Cliff, Cliff Bennett. I mean, I guys, I can't, maybe I'll just do leukemia just to get rid of all the hair and be done. It's probably aggressive, but at least I'll be shiny and bold. Cause I, I do not like having hair. Um, oh, I need God. a little shave right now. I mean, look at that. So yeah, when you said solar panels, what were you talking about? The top of your head or actually your house? 100. Look at that thing. Look at that. Good Lord. The reflection Blast. that I need polarized sunglasses. Uh, we got Cliff Cliff Bennett. Uh, everything we caught today was on a hair jig with a Berkeley Little Chopper as a trailer and um, smothered that sucker in smelly jelly. I do believe scent is a hell of a thing this time of year. Oh, that's the topic. That's one we can certainly discuss. Um, it. It's it's not just scent. It's I mean, it you, you want something that's going to stink a little bit um, because if it stinks, it's typically going to taste how it smells. I know that from using smelly jelly, you get that shit. It tastes exactly like it smells. Um, but for those, for those fish, you know, one of the things that we experience in the wintertime is we don't feel the bite, right? Cause they'll come up and they'll just put it in their mouth, but they're not really like summertime when they come up and put something in their mouth, they're fucking cho Ooh, Can I curse? I don't yeah, know. Curse. They're choking it down quick, right? Cause they're looking for their next meal already wintertime they're they're putting it in their mouth and you might not feel it like you would in the summertime so when you get anything that helps them taste it they bite into it and it tastes like garlic and freaking salt that tastes like blood they think that they've just killed something real so they hold on to it a little bit longer and that bite detection by holding on to it a little bit longer is really i think how most people are catching fish in the wintertime I think that's why I have I have such a love hate with gulp because I just call it one and done. You usually I think you catch one on it and then it's basically you're done with that bait. You got to get a new one on there. But when all else fails, you put a Berkeley gulp minnow on or something else like that, and they will hold on to that thing a lot longer. Um, yeah. Especially when I'm Demiki rigging right now, and I had a, a couple of my Demiki rig baits today, and they all drop down there. You drift over a rock, and they'll nose to it. And then turn, but you put the gulp on there and they just a split second longer, they take a bite out of it. So I 100% right. agree with you there. 
Yeah, it's for me, it's a bite detection aspect. Um, I think in the you know in the summertime during tournaments, I'll throw I'll throw smelly jelly on my baits. Um, I'll dip them in smelly jelly just because I, you know, if I'm in a tournament, I don't want to take any chances. Um, but wintertime, I'm always using always using something, whether it's smelly jelly or something else. I mean, smelly jelly is my one of choice. Um, the bass uh, bass feast. I think is the either that or the crawfish Denise or some crap like that. Both of those smell like bleh, bleh, like not good. Um, but yeah, like that's those those the bass feast is something else. It's something else. I'm gonna have to look into that one too. It's Pro- pink, has glitter on it. So here I'm gonna tell you a quick story. This is great. First time I ever used smelly jelly. I come home from fishing and I got glitter like all over my face. I got, I got glitter on my fingers and my hands and I'm getting home like after dark. Right. And my wife was like, why do you have glitter all over your face? A gay rave. Um, I went fishing with Jeff. <laughs> I don't know. Like it, it's, it's terrible, but it's true. Just be maybe take some baby wipes with you. Kayaking any time of year is different, but especially, you know, in the winter time, what do you, how do you rig up if, if you go out this time of year? And I know Jeff has done about 10,000 videos on this specifically, but particularly for you, I mean, I know you got your Torquedo on there. Um, do you have an anchor? What kind of clothes do you take with you? Things like that to make sure you don't like, so it, die. An anchor is huge. If you ask Jeff, two anchors are huge. Um, I only run one. Um, Jeff likes to run two anchors because he wants to stop his boat from moving no matter what. And a lot of that comes down to bite detection. If you're anchored, your boat's not going forward or backwards, down up or down river, but it may be moving side to side. And that side to side may make you miss a bite. So Jeff likes to anchor from both directions. Um, if you're on a boat or kayak that has spot lock, you know, you could argue and say that that's the same, but it's really not because you're still going to move a little bit and that spot lock is still going to kick in and going to make you do this or make you do that. Um, so the anchor is huge. In my opinion, it's really huge. Um, getting yourself to stop moving will help you detect a bite. Um so, I, you know, in the wintertime, I'll typically use my motor to get to wherever I'm going to fish and then I'll anchor up and then I'll start fishing. Um, <clears throat> in, you know, in terms of clothing from a kayak specifically, I always and like, you know, from November until probably mid April, I'm wearing a dry suit because that water temperature mm-hmm. is below typically around 50 or below. And when the air temperatures are around the same, you can get hypothermia really quick. If you fall in or you get wet, like it can be a real bad day for you. And if you're out there by yourself, which I like to fish by myself most of the time, um, you know, by the time you realize it, it might be too late. So that dry suit is huge. You know, it's, it's a very, very important aspect. Um, You know, you can get cheap dry suits from 500, to you know, seven fifty, but the better ones are up around fifteen hundred, like the Coca Tats and stuff like that. So Damn. that's a huge aspect of it. Um, in Pennsylvania, I know at least in Pennsylvania, you have to wear your your life jacket. I think between November first and April thirty first, maybe. Um, so that's that's a big aspect too, uh, making sure you have a good life jacket that's going to keep you above water. Because whenever you fall in, if you would fall in, the the one thing that's going to kill you the quickest is that first gulp of of water that you're taking from that gasp that you can't that you can't control. If you fall into forty degree water, and it can be sixty degrees outside, you fall into forty degree water, and you're going, <gasps> that's going in your lungs. Right. And that's going to be probably game over if you're underwater. That's why the life jacket is so incredibly important. Um, so, the, you know, the life jacket and the 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 um, dry suit are huge. 
In terms of layering up underneath of there, I like to use moisture wicking stuff. I'll wear like a, a, a base layer, very similar to hunting, really. Um, I'll wear a base layer of like light, not lightweight, but kind of like <coughs> midweight um, Under Armour. Something that will certainly keep me warm, but also wick that moisture away from my skin because you don't want to be wet underneath of your layers because that's a that's going to be for make for a terrible day of fishing. Um, after that, I'll do like an insulating layer of something. Um, depending on the air temperature, you know, I might go with that insulating layer or I may just go with something like a like a sweatshirt or a pair of, you know, um, like joggers or something like that. Um, but if it's like, if it's really cold, I'll wear an insulating layer underneath of the outer layer of my jogger and, and hoodie or no, well, not really hoodie. You don't want to wear a hoodie while you're, if you're wearing a dry suit, but, um, I'll wear, you know, just like a, a sweatshirt of some sort. So, um, and then on the, you know, once you put your dry suit on, um, if you want to, if it's, if it's so cold and you want to be extra, extra warm, um, you can wear like a parka and bibs or something over top of your dry suit too. The, the thing with that is, you know, you got to realize that if you have to pee, you got to take that parka and that hoodie or that parka and that, and that bibs off. And then there's like that little, you know, that zipper pouch. I think it's only like a foot and a half wide. I mean, it's not big enough for me. I don't know if it's big enough for you or not, but that is not going to work for me for the amount I piss on a boat. <laughs> I'd rather just get hyperthermia and die. So, um, so, but yeah, it's, you know, it's a struggle. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I don't wintertime fish as much as I could. Because you um, want to be able to piss. <laughs> not going to lie to you. Jeff asks me all the time, you want to go fishing? And I'm like, when? April? Yes. March? Yes. February? No. No, Jeffrey. No, I don't want to go fishing in February. I want to go to, I want to do podcasts and go to fishing shows in January and February. That's what I want to do. Or I want to drive to Florida and fish. That would be fun too. I think there, I think the first Hobie tournaments on the Harris chain at the end of January, if I'm not mistaken. I think you're right. Um, actually, well, now you just stepped into that with the whole Hobie thing. So I got to get your opinion. <clears throat> What are you going to ask me? Um, Hobie decided to do something interesting, and they were going to go with motors now. Yeah. I probably, I, I've already said my piece on, on multiple shows, but what are your thoughts? So I haven't heard what you've said um, about, about what your thoughts are on it, but my thoughts are this. I believe that Hobie was the toughest test for a kayak angler that there could be mm -hmm. because it was all human powered. There was an athletic physicality portion to it that really could separate some people from others as to, you know, as to who could go out there and do well. I loved that aspect of it. I loved the aspect that Hobie was human powered only. Um, I understand why they had to allow motors because their attendance was severely lacking this year with the resurgence resurgence of bass because bass under new leadership with Steve Owens was ran correctly. Um, be, you know, the fact that of it being run by a kayak angler was huge and not some guy that, you know, but bass boat fishes, you know, Steve-O brought, brought the, the attendance up to where bass really has wanted it to be. And, that gave people a decision to make and say, am I going to fish bass or am I going to fish Hobie? And I think Hobie lost some of their numbers because of that. So the only way to combat that is to make your product appealing to a bigger audience. And now Hobie is allowing motors. Do I agree with it? No. Um, does it mean that I won't fish it? No. I, I think that the motor aspect, I mean, I'm, I'm sponsored by Torquedo. Like I love the fact now that I can, use my motor in a Hobie tournament if I go fish it. But I, I still would have loved to have seen Hobie say human powered only 
and then Bass B motor only or but motor or either, whichever. American League National League baseball. 100 percent. Yeah. And I think it's the unless unless there's 40 chest and like Hobie's buying out Torquedo or something like that crazy. I think it's the dumbest decision ever. And I don't understand when you Bass is not a manufacturer of anything. They're just a tournament organization. Hobie owns kayaks. You do right. this to help with that. If you really wanted to increase your numbers, how about this? Raise the winnings. Boom. You can do things like that. So I have opinions on that too. I Go think um, part part of one of the reasons why I think Hobie lost some attendance this year is because they they made rules um, because of people doing things that maybe that they shouldn't have been doing but the people that were doing those things are still fishing the series and even if 20 people decided not to fish the series because of that that's 20 less people that might be going to that tournament um and the rules that i'm talking about are like the designated launches and um like the public aspect you know the public aspect of what's public and what's not there were anglers that were pushing those boundaries so they went they went to designated launches and said, okay, well, these are the launches that you now have to use. And for a kayak angler, that's stupid. That is so stupid because we don't have the ability to cover the water that bass boat anglers or other anglers of different types, even John boat anglers can cover more water than we can. So we don't have that ability to cover the water especially with it being human powered, which you certainly didn't have the ability to cover that amount of water. So taking that aspect of it away and saying, okay, you've done all this work in prior to pre-fishing, mm. you've done all this research on this body of water. Mm -hmm. And then you went and found a legal launch to launch from that sets a lot of people apart because not a lot of people are going to put that amount of work into it. And I personally think that they may have lost some numbers because of some of the new rules that were put into it. I think that that definitely could be a part of it. Um, there's this reaction in the industry, and you see this in any industry, where it's we to maximize what what works and we can generate more revenue, we need to be like somebody else. And in fishing, it's like we must be bass because if we're bass, people will like us. You know, if you're Chick Fil A, you can't go. I'm. I'm going to try to compete and make a Whopper. If I wanted a Whopper, I'm going, going to go to Burger King. King. Right. If I want to fish bass, I'm going to go to bass. And you trying right. to be bass, MLF, take note, it's not going to work. You're just going to lose who you have. And this idea of basically caving and let's just be like bass because our numbers are down. Things go in ebb and flows. Have your brand, have your constituents, and just be you. And again, I because that organization is run through we sell kayaks we have a diversified portfolio i know that they could raise their entry fees if they wanted to i mean not their fees i'm sorry their, their their prizes they could raise that up a little bit i'm not saying a lot but they could be more competitive than bass because here's the thing and this is what people don't understand with bass bass can't raise much more right if an organization comes in that is diversified like amazon doing movies amazon's doing movies now and they're spending a billion dollars they don't give a shit that's not the thing that they do Hobie has a position, I think, with them being kind of diversified. If they say, like, yeah, we're going to put an extra 2000 bucks to the winner. Now you're going to show up because you have a better prize. Well, I mean, with that, that being with that being said, too, um, that was another aspect. I think that I don't think it was a, as big of an aspect as some of the rule, other rule changes. But Hobie changed their payout structure from 10 percent to 15 percent, I believe for 2023. So they were paying out more people, which meant there was prize money coming away from those top spots. Mm -hmm. And personally, I like it at 10%. I mean, if I go someplace and I don't cash a check mm -hmm. because I didn't fish good enough to cash a check, then I don't deserve a fucking check. You I, know, the rule is 10%. If it's 10% and you know, you got to get within it, you know, if it's a hundred people, you got to get within the top 10. I don't feel bad for you. If you, if you fish or if you finished 11th, Mm -hmm. I've been in that exact fucking position. <laughs> I, I was in a tournament where they had, they paid out nine spots and I finished 10th and I drove home the entire time thinking to myself, man, if I would have just landed that one fish, I didn't drive home thinking to myself, man, I wish they raised that up 15% and then I would have cut a check. No, 
No, that's here's your fucking participation trophy. It is such a reactionary thing. I feel like it's no different than Bud Light, Miller Light, those commercials that went down. It's just people that are losing sight of their community that they built and they're chasing somebody else. And I think it's really going to hurt them. If it was just one year or two years of attendance going down, I feel like this could kill them and again. Because if you've watched what happened with the MLF Bass thing, if you do that, you're going to hurt your own brand. Mm-hmm. The um, the NPFL, I think, is another great example. The NPFL is like, listen, we're not going to be in the drama. We do our own shit. We launch our schedule last so it doesn't interfere. And people love the NPFL and they're growing because they're like, we're just going to do our own thing. We're not trying to be Bass or MLF. I hope you being such a prestigious brand. I was just really shocked. Like, just do your own thing. And eventually it'll, it'll level it back out. But yeah, so- it is what it is. The last, the last aspect I think of, of why their attendance may have dropped this year compared to years past is, you know, they, they, they did, um, change up some of the locations. And although I think most of their, most of their locations were amazing, there were some places that people had never heard before. People had never been to, um, you know, and they took a big one. They took a big one off the schedule and replaced it with the new river. Mm -hmm. Um, when you take the Susquehanna off the schedule in the summertime, I, that to me is probably the stupidest thing you could do. I would argue that there is not a fishery that fishes better than the Susquehanna does in July and August anywhere in this country. But the Susquehanna is not even on it this year, right? Coming up. It's not. And again, and that's the thing again. It's just, I keep going back to it. Stop trying to be bass. Stop it. Why are you well, going to all the same places Bass does? It's just so. But no, but see, Bass did that. Bass did that. Hobie went to the Susquehanna for, I think, three or four years in a row. And then all of a sudden, Bass came out and did a Susquehanna event yeah, in October. Yeah. But it, even if Bass does an event in October, why not still try to put one on the river in, in July or August? Like, mm-hmm. who cares if you go to the same place? Because. Like it is an amazing fishery between between the time it opens and 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 honestly November, it is there. I no, it, there's it's, not it's, a better summertime fishery. No, so I agree. I agree. You know, it, you look. I think they had close. They had just over a hundred or so for the for the BOS on the New River this year, and I think what did they have the the year prior on the for the the BOS in July, I think it was like 196. So you basically just lost a hundred people to your average by going to the new river. Dude, the new river is daunting. It's, it's daunting. Right? I love that it was on the schedule. I mean, I love that it was on the schedule too, but, it, but you, you have effectively not appealed to 50% of kayakers because of the, how daunting that river system is. I agree. And what I think they should have done is kept both the new and the Susky on the river on it instead. Of, but again, that's just me like have a couple. A I think of, you got, I think you got to do the new river earlier in the year than, than, than yes, something you do have to do the new river earlier. I think, I mean, so two parts there. So for my previous thing about bass, it's this idea that what we need to do is we need to go to Lake Gunnersville 20 times. And we need to do everything Bass does and we'll have great attendance. And I think that's completely the incorrect way to run an organization. I've always said that. Right. It's not just about it's not about attendance because it was about it. If it's just about how many people you'd get, you would have every terminal like Lake Gunnersville. That right. would be boring as hell. But your attendance is great. Who gives a shit? This is a professional tour to show off your skill. Some events right. might be a little bit lower, but I want to see you or Christine. Good luck on the new river. You might die and drown. I want to see <laughs> that happen for my entertainment. If I wanted to go just fish the local place 20 times, I can do that as a local club angler. And again, it gets down to these these organizations just being like, we just got it. It's just about the bottom line. And when you do that, eventually you're going to run your brand into the ground. Flipping it around to what I just said earlier um, about kayaking in general from an outsider, not a pure-blooded kayaker. If you're trying to market kayaking, one thing that really I think hit home with a lot of people is you get to go places you can't do it in a boat. MLF even tried to sprinkle this in with the boat guys. Of, We're going to go to these lakes around North Carolina that you've never heard of. Kayaking, right. the New River, the Susquehanna. These are cool ass places to go. Why are you always trying to go to the Gunnersville, the Cayugas? I get keeping some of them on the schedule, but that's not one of the sexy appeals of kayak fishing. And right. when I looked at the Hobie schedule now, 
It's like a big boat tournament deal. And I just, it's sad. That's what I really can't. It's, like, it's just sad that you're not going to these cool places that only kayaks can go. So one, one thing I'll say just about some of the stuff that you said, because I don't want, I don't want our opinions to be taken as one in the same. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm not really not truly disagreeing with you, but in a way that I am, I don't think the Hobie's going to fail because of who leads it. Um, AJ is, he's a, he's an old head in kayaking, right? AJ is in tune with the, with the market and knows, knows what the, you know, the competitive market wants. Um, and you know, he truly cares about the brand that is Hobie. Um, AJ will not let it fail. I can promise you that he won't let it fail. Even if he experiences a couple years of adversity, AJ is the type of person that will not let that series fail. And honestly, when you look at that series and you look at the way that their championship is set up, it's, it's, it's the best championship that we have in kayak fishing. Because it's the top 50. I think they increased it to 60 last year. It's the best of the best. There is an actual qualification. There's not participation trophies and participation invites that people get. To some degree, making it to the Bassmaster Kayak Classic is still, I mean, they're, they're still letting people from state series enter into the Classic. And some of these state series may only have six or eight people fishing a, a championship to get there. That's a, that's a participation invite. That's a way to get their numbers up. It's not a championship. It is not a championship. The Bassmaster Kayak Classic is not a championship. It is important. Like if you go and you win it, congratulations, you did a great job. I'm not taking that away from it, but it is not a championship of who is the best kayak angler in the country at that point in time, because there are so many participation handouts, um, you know, given out at the state level. Um, to get there. And that's, that's unfortunately, it has to happen because otherwise, well, I, I shouldn't say it has to, it doesn't have to happen, but that's the way it's set up. And that's the way that they're trying to get these kayak nations stayed up, you know, started up in the States because that they want to have, you know, Bass, Bass's footprint wants to be larger. Um, I personally don't agree with it. I think a Bass nation at the state level has no business having a kayak tournament series. I think it's stupid. I think it's an oversaturation um, of an already oversaturated market, really, when you look in terms of what, what's available at the local level. So I think having that avenue to get to the Bassmaster Kayak Classic is kind of silly. And that's one, that's one thing that will always set Hobie apart, is that if you make it to the Hobie Tournament of Champions, you have finished in either the top three of any of their events or whoever may have qualified that way, that spot, if they're in the top 50, that spot gets rolled down to the next spot, to the next person. But you're only taking, I think last year, I'm, I'm misspeaking because last year it was 60, but you're only taking 60 anglers, but those 60 anglers have the highest amount of points mm -hmm. up throughout the year to qualify for that Hobie tournament. <laughs> so in, in no way, shape or form will Hobie fail because they are the truest form of what we have as far as a, a, a national champion of kayak fishing for bass. Are they a tournament organization first or a kayak company first? They are a kayak company first. The, they are, they are the, you know, it's their series, but when you think about it, so this is this is one thing with the Hobie series. That Hobie series sold Hobie boats because it was it was human powered only, right? So nobody wants to paddle in a human powered only event, right? So people so were going out and buying pedal drive kayaks because that's how you that's how you move, that's how you cover water. So the Hobie 360 um and any really any of the Hobie boats that had that have the fins were a very popular way of fishing those tournaments, which meant people were going out and buying those boats. So then basically if they increase their attendance, but they hurt their kayak sales, is that a victory? No, 
No. I, I know a bunch of people now that are like, I don't have to get, I don't have to look at pedal power because I have a Torquedo. Um, well, why, why, why spend six thousand dollars on a pedal kayak only when you can go buy a a good eighteen hundred to two thousand dollar boat that you would paddle and then put a three thousand dollar motor on it and then you can be fat and lazy and still catch the same amount of fish or you know our, our friend trey if you could please ever answer my phone call um innovative sportsman you know if you have his two or three years ago you really could you'd be at a disadvantage in a hobie event right yes. you still have to paddle guess what yes. now you can use this thing no problem it, it just mm -hmm. when i said it's going to be a failure it's not the series it's the company of how badly is this going to hurt your bottom line in kayak sales trying to chase bass it just i don't i want to have him on the show to think the logic and maybe there's something maybe there's just going to be all trolling motor brands they're going to build their own trolling motor possibly that could be their their 3d chest move but without them buying Torquedo or, or having some kind of ownership as a trolling motor company, it just feels like they're shooting themselves in the foot because, you, I mean, you just said it earlier, you don't need a $5,000, $6,000 Hobie, you know, 360 anymore necessarily. You can right. make do with so many others. And that's where I'm just, I, was it worth it? I don't know. I, I don't, I mean, personally, I don't think it is. I don't think it's worth it. Yeah. I think that, you know, if they lose one kayak sale off of not having this series being human powered only i don't think it's worth it, it i mean it, why why decrease i don't want to say decrease the the competitive level of what you're doing but they in a, in a way they are decreasing the competitive level of it because to fish a hobie tournament and be successful and cover water under your own power you can't be grossly obese there is a physicality that that comes to it. Agreed. Um, so I, you know, we'll see what happens. I'm sure their numbers will go up this year, and they'll see it as a success. But when they look at their overall sales at the end That's of the year, the and they and they miss, you know, they miss out on selling 20 boats because somebody fished a Hobie series and realized they couldn't compete without having a pedal drive. Was That's... it a win? I don't. I don't think it's a win in that case, yeah. but. Yeah. I agree with you. I think I think there's enough people that already have boats with motors that say, "Well, I'm just not going to fish the Hobie series because I have a boat with a motor and they they don't allow motors." There's enough people there that maybe can make up that number in the attendance, you know, that may make them have all warm fuzzies, but for me, I I I don't see it as being a smart business move for Hobie. And and that was the rant I did a week ago, guys. I think I uploaded that episode. I'll see if I re-uploaded it. But was that it'll be short-term game, but it could be long-term problems because I think they'll see a spike and everything. But you're right. A bunch of people have Hobie kayaks now, but in five, six years, will well, they dip your sales if you, you know, do that? I don't well, know. when you look at it, right? Like Hobie, the Hobie tournament series pays back like 97% to the angler. Hobie doesn't make shit off of having their own tournament series. Yep. So the only way that they collected revenue off of having that tournament series was the sale of boats. It, I preach. That's why I'm just so confused. <laughs> I'm so, so confused. That would be like, that would be like Torquedo going out and creating a tour, a tournament series and getting sponsored by Newport. Like it just doesn't make any fucking sense. Like that's why I'm so confused. It doesn't make sense, but bass has put something in the water to where everyone wants to be bass instead of like, we're just going to do our own thing. Fuck you. And that's what they need to do. Just be yourself and people will respect you. And Hobie was different and it was cool. And you know, this was not just a tirade by this, but this is one of the decisions that has just really like, I feel like they'll talk about this at business. It could be two ways. It could be great or it could be a disaster. If it's a disaster, he will be talking about this in business schools of what not to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'll just leave it at that. And I have to be somewhat careful, you know, being yeah. sponsored by Torquedo. And even more so, more important than the sponsorship, because the sponsorship is what it is. You know, AJ is a friend of mine. Steve-O is a friend of mine. I have to be very careful in how I word things. And I think each entity do something different really well. I I know that it probably was not AJ's decision and I can't speak for him, but I know that it probably was not his decision to allow motors. I don't feel like we are knocking Torquedo when it's like We're, a pedal kayak league. 
No, and, and we're not. We're not. Um, but in terms of, you know, sponsorship wise, disagreeing with a tournament entity allowing a motor versus not could be perceived as, well, are you trying to promote us or not? You know what I mean? So I'm careful in that sense. Yeah. I have my personal opinion. And my personal opinion is, is that my torpedo makes me a better fisherman because it lets me cover more water. A hundred percent. A hundred. So yeah. there's always going to be that aspect that I'll preach to people that my torpedo is I've had the same torpedo for like three and three years and some change now. And I have beaten the life out of it. And I've cruised up and down the Susquehanna river hundreds of miles on. Mm -hmm. And it, it allows me to fish better than anybody else that's out there pedaling or cat or kai or paddling. So I'll still promote it, but I still think that Hobie should have been human powered only. Flipping it. Cause I know we can get th this will probably come up again, guys in 2024. Don't worry. Um, do you think we've had so many leagues pop up? I've been saying for the longest time, you could make the best smallmouth river league in the world. You could have the new river, upper James, Shenandoah river, upper Potomac from the break line, all the way up to Pawpaw, Susquehanna. That's five events each year uh, on probably some of the best smallmouth rivers on the East coast, you know, excluding the St. Lawrence. I would love to see something like that happen to test yeah. river anglers out in so many places. You mentioned the new river. It was a terrible time of year to go, but that, that place no one knows about. It is like Jurassic park, yeah. but it's cool. Well, I mean, dude, during practice of the new river event, somebody caught like a damn near 24 inch smallmouth. <laughs> They're in there. Like yeah. mind blown. I don't see fish like that here on the side. Like my nipples just got, do you see that? <laughs> My nipples just got hard thinking about a 24 inch smallmouth, dude. Like, I got to cover my shit because, mm. like, I, I'm glad I'm not standing right now or you yeah. would see my erection on a 24 inch smallmouth. It's insane, dude. But, it's insane. yes, you're right. Like, having that series would be absolutely epic. I don't know if we have enough anglers to make it truly successful yet because you got to realize a lot of kayakers are new. A lot of kayakers don't know, don't even know how to paddle correctly. And when you go to some of these rivers, the upper Potomac, the new, even the Shenandoah in some spots, I don't know much about the James. I've never fished it. I really want to. The Susquehanna in a lot of spots. If you don't know how to paddle, you are flirting with danger. I've always so, thought that, that kind of series would be one that would be perfect for a Torquedo to sponsor, like to own, so to speak, because like, Oh, you need a torpedo on a river to, to be like a prop pedal drive is not going to yeah. work on the river. And, and, and honestly, you could you could run that series, you know, starting on the new like in April and and, and going, you know, go into the James in late April. Like I would do a couple events really early in the year. Um, and then I would have, you know, uh, maybe you go to the Potomac in in July and, the, you know, I don't know, like some, but you could, you could really, you could really have a freaking awesome series of just rivers. Um, would you split the Juliata and Susquehanna into two separate events? The Juniata. Yes. I would split it into the Juniata, the not Juni the Juliata, God but the Juniata. I would separate it into a different event. Yes. Um, the Juniata is its own fishery. It That's is okay. 100 percent its own fishery. Um, and in the summertime, it's even more of its own fishery because there's resident fish there that do not go back to the Susquehanna. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets tough to fish in the summertime in terms of catching big fish. You can catch as many fish as you want to catch in the Juniata in the summertime. But if you want to catch big fish, they get out there in those, you know, there's there's like there's a deep channel that runs down through the middle of the Juniata in most places. and a lot of the Juniata has a lot of that long stranded grass in it and you'll see them. You'll, you'll go up to Juniata and you'll be moving cause it's typically gin clear and you look down in like six, seven feet of water and you see this grass flats just kind of like laying over with where the current's pushing them. And then underneath of them, there's this fucking giant smallmouth that you're never going to be able to catch. That's so cool. Um, it, you know, they, it's the same way for musky, like the musky get down in there and they just thrive down there in the summertime. 
but to really truly expose that fishery for what it has, you got to do it before the grass gets thick. We've covered the gamut, and I got to like throw one more thing in there. Is <clears throat> I think the New River and the Juniata are the two big unknowns of, of I think the premier smallmouth river fisheries on the East Coast. Is there another one that comes to mind that's not too like super secret? Uh, course, I mean, I'm talking excluding the 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 uh, St. Lawrence. Man, I think the Delaware gets overlooked a lot. The right. upper stretches of the Delaware, yeah. I think the upper stretches of the Delaware gets overlooked often. And I know a lot of, you know, a couple of guides that fish out there and produce high quality fish in good numbers. Um, I think the upper stretches of the Delaware get neglected um, in terms of being an excellent river fishery. Um, and another that I would argue, I don't know much about the Ohio rivers, but I know much. I know a little bit about like some of the Western PA rivers. Um, the Yakagani, it gets neglected in terms of big fish capability, but there's big fish that live in it. Um, the Allegheny is another one that has, been, I think they shocked. Oh God, line of year. I think they shocked like a 22 inch smallmouth out of the Allegheny. Like there's big fish that live there. They just, you know, they're hard to catch. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's some, there's some, you know, a couple little hidden gems that we have up here that not a lot of people know about that don't get talked about a lot that I think could, you know, could stand their own against maybe like a Shenandoah or probably not the James and the new, depending on the time of year. Um, the new is a freak because of some of the long fish that they have. The James is close to it. Upper Potomac. Um it takes 23 pounds to 25 pounds to win a spring jet boat tournament. Right yeah. Now. It's, I've I mean, they, you know, good. they live there, man. Like we, we have good water that produces good fish. Um, you know, the Juniata in the springtime, I think could stand a chance against, you know, if you were fishing the Juniata in April and someone was fishing freaking Gunnersville in April, I think if you put the same quality angler in the same place, like Jesus, that's insane. <laughs> like the Judy had a dude, it's there's big fish to go up there, man. Is it just not as good access? Cause I know there are some of these rivers, it's a news example. It's like, it's just, it's a hard thing to get into. And now the Juniata has great access. It does. Okay. Yeah. There's, I mean, I feel like there's a boat ramp, you know, every five miles on that river. It seems like, damn. Um, there is a lot of boat ramps, a lot of Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission ramps all the way up to freaking Raystown. There's a lot of ramps. Hmm. So it's not a ramp issue. Interesting. It's not an access issue. Jake, I don't want you to get in trouble with your wife tonight. I know you got a lot of honeydew stuff to do. Um, you know, what What can we promote and pimp out for you besides your OnlyFans? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I got my feet finder account, too. Um, <laughs> I'll send you I'll send you some feet pics whenever we're done. Um, you know, the biggest thing for me is just, you know, that boat, that innovative sportsman boat, you know, by Trey Leach. Um, he's got the Osprey 1436. And now he's got the 12 foot version as well for people who don't want a 14 foot boat. Um, you know, those that individual has done so much for me in this in this thing that is kayak fishing that I would never want to neglect the opportunity to promote his boats. Um, and of course, you know, Torquedo, Yak Attack, Temple Fork Outfitters, and now Bates Reels too. Um, I'm working a little bit with them. Um, those are freaking, I mean, they're high end reels, but man, they're amazing. But, uh, and I guess my jersey sponsor too, Wildwear America. Amanda, she always, I, I always forget her, but she always sends me messages and checks on me and makes sure that I haven't died or started doing drugs. So, um, you know, those people have done a lot to help me in this business, so I don't want to neglect mentioning them. As always, guys, you know, please go. As always, Jake's uh, social media, everything that we talked about, we linked down to go. Please follow him on his journey uh, next year. Like and subscribe to our channel. Again, guys, please join us on Patreon. Remember, if we hit 1,000 subscribers, I have permission from Maryland and Virginia DWRs. We're starting our own nonprofit to help supplementally stock our fisheries, especially the smallmouth bass problem because the Alabama bass is in our local waterways. And we need to combat that. So I got permission. We're starting our own nonprofit to help actually stock 
fast back in our fisheries. So please help us hit that goal. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. The oh, one, one second, one second. Oh. The first person to subscribe after this episode will get feet picks from me. <laughs> and then there goes the whole Patreon, and everyone starts <laughs> exiting <exodusing> vast numbers. <laughs> you can put. I'm going to send you my feet picks, and you can post them on your Patreon. How I'll about that? I'll tell you what. If you send me a good picture of your feet, they have to be autographed. I'll put it right behind me for no, episodes. You won't. Just I, I'll do. I'm, I'm crazy enough to bet. Do bet i'll do that if i hit a thousand patreons in 2024 i will do an edible and come on the show and we'll talk um i'll do anything possible <laughs> oh, all right this will get some rowdy guys so to make sure this doesn't get demonetized on the re-upload i'll talk to you guys later and this this recording is over bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.